In this video, I'm going to show you how a few simple rules can generate patterns as complex as the ones you're seeing right now. Let's begin with the most simple, one-dimensional example. Imagine having an array of squares which can either be black or white. The squares will decide which color to pick based on their current color and the color of their adjacent squares. Let's take this configuration for example. Based on the rule below, any square with a black square to its left will turn black. Otherwise, the square either stays white or turns white if it was black. So the only square which meets the criteria to turn black is this one. All of the other squares will be white in the next iteration. If we continue updating the squares, you can see that the result we get is the black square moving to the right by one space with each iteration. Let's see what this looks like if, instead of padding over the squares, we draw a new set of squares for every iteration. As you can see, we're already getting a pattern, but because there is only one configuration which re results in a square turning black, the pattern is quite simple. Let's increase the resolution and define some more rules. You can see that there are 8 different possible arrangements of black and white squares next to each other. You can look online if you want to find some of the most famous set of rules which result in some of the more interesting patterns. I'm going to pick this one, which is one of the most famous ones. Alright, now we're getting somewhere. This is much better. As you can see, the pattern keeps going on and on forever, and many people have tried finding some repeating patterns in order to predict how it evolves over time, but with rules like this one, there seem to be no repetitions, each part of the simulation seems to be unique. If I keep changing the rules, you can see that even a slightest change makes a drastic difference in the pattern generated. What we've just made is called cellular automata. A set of cells in a grid which evolve over time based on their state and the state of their neighbors. Even when one-dimensional, they generate some fascinating results, each unique in its own way. The examples you're seeing right now were discovered by Stephen Wolfram in the 1980s, although the concept of cellular automata dates back a couple of decades earlier. If we go back in time a little to the 1970s, we're going to find probably the most famous cellular automata, John Conway's Game of Life. Although the game of life is two-dimensional, it's in a way much simpler than the one-dimensional examples we just saw. That's because in this example there are only three rules which determine how the system evolves. First of all, any given cell in the simulation has two states, alive, which we're going to draw as black, and dead, which we're going to draw as white. To determine the next state of any cell, we need to look at the neighbor cells and count the number of neighbors which are alive. Then we can apply the three rules. First, if there are less than two or more than three living neighbors, the cell dies. Second, if there are two or three living neighbors, the cell survives. And third, if the cell is dead, but the number of living neighbors is exactly three, the cell becomes alive. And that's it. That's all we need for the game of life to do its magic. For the initial state of the grid, I will randomize the entire grid so that every cell has a 50-50% chance of either being alive or dead. Let's hit play and see what we have so far. As you can see, the first stages of the simulation are typically very chaotic. It's pretty much impossible to predict what kind of patterns you're going to get. Over time, the simulation slowly stabilizes. The cells either eventually die out or they reach a pattern where a couple of cells keep each other constantly alive. They can either stabilize in a way where the cells stop changing at all, or they can enter a state of oscillation. If I draw a simple plus sign and play the simulation, you'll see that it evolves a little bit and then enters into this loop where it switches between two states. For an example of when the cells become static, we can draw a simple 2x2 two two square of alive cells, and even if I run the simulation, nothing happens. This is because each living cell in this configuration has exactly three living neighbors, so they keep each other alive. There are also patterns which have a certain behavior, for example the glider, which moves along the grid or Gasper's glider gun, which continuously creates new gliders. That's how the base of the algorithm works, but from here you can let your imagination take over, by applying rules of your own or changing the way you display the grid. For example, let's make the background black by marking the dead cells as black and then assign a different color to the living cells. For example, I will choose this nice shade of green. This is already a bit more pretty than what we had before, but now we can make the color of the living cells change as the cells are being updated. Finally, instead of instantly painting the cells black when they die, I will make them slowly fade away. This creates kind of a dusty, particle-like look. 
I encourage you to try out this algorithm for yourself and come up with your own creative ideas about how to make it even more beautiful. So with one-dimensional simulations, we took a bunch of iterations and stitched them together to form a 2D image. But what would happen if we did the same thing with the game of life, which is already 2D? Well, we would get the third dimension, making the render of the simulation 3D. Here's my result. Instead of drawing cells or pixels, we're going to use cubes to display each iteration of the simulation. Instead of drawing two different types of cubes, one for cells which are alive and one for those uh, which are dead, we're only going to create a cube if the cell is alive. If the cell dies, we simply don't spawn a cube in the next iteration. As you can see, this creates some beautiful towering structures. 